Sangshik Kong. Um, uh, my name is Sangshik Kong. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the Ohio State University. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Christina and Simone for giving me an opportunity to give a talk at today's seminar. The title of my talk is Inferring Phylogenetic Networks from Sequence Data Using Composite Likelihood. And in this talk, I'm going to summarize a number of studies that I have conducted throughout my graduate studies involving phylogenetic metrics. All right, so I'm interested in studying phylogenetic metrics because trees often overlook some important biological processes like hybridization, where two species interbreed and create a novel lineage or novel species. The trees and the networks are similar in a way that they both are composed of a set of nodes and the branches that connect those nodes together but the networks are distinguished from the trees by a reticulation structure that is created by a reticulation node that has in degree two and out degree one denoting a hybridization event. So here we can say species four is the hybrid daughter of species three and species five. In literature, the networks are largely classified into abstract and explicit network, networks. And although those two are two very different things, their distinction in practice is sometimes vague. An example of abstract network is shown here on the left side and an example of explicit network on the right side. And abstract networks uh, are, looks very different from the typical phylogenetic tree that we know of, but it's very colorful where different colors represent different haplotypes or different sequences, uh, which means abstract networks can work with large data sets that contains many sequences. On the other hand, explicit networks looks very similar to the typical phylogenetic tree, but it has horizontal edges between tree branches, denoting complex evolutionary processes like gene flow or hybridization. But explicit networks has a much fewer number of tips compared to the abstract network because uh, estimating explicit networks lacks scalability, meaning the computational time to estimate them becomes infeasibly large as the number of sequences in the data set or the number of reticulations in a topology increases. So this leads to the question, um, which is if estimating explicit networks lacks scalability, why can't we just always use abstract networks? And in fact, this was the main question I had for my master's thesis. And I approached this question in two different ways, philosophically and using empirical data sets, using one of the most popularly used abstract network called median joining network. Yeah, so the first half of my thesis where the paper has been published in cladistics in 2015, mm -hmm. Uh, I argued that median joining network is not evolutionarily informative. Uh, an example of median joining network is shown here. And to briefly go over how to read this, the hollow circles represent haplotypes or sequences and larger the circle, larger the number of haplotypes that it contains. The black dots or black circles represent median vectors that is created by the algorithm that can be interpreted as unsampled or extinct haplotypes. And the edges that connects two nodes together has a number beside them that tells us the position of the nucleotide in an alignment where the differences between two haplotypes were observed. Yeah, so the first reason that I argue that median joining network is not evolutionarily informative is that it lacks evolutionary directionality. Therefore, we can't identify the ancestral descendant relationships between haplotypes, which is the main thing that we need to get out from a phylogenetic tree. The second reason is that median, because median joining network is a distance-based uh, method, it clusters sequences based on the overall similarity, just like in phonetics, meaning that some ways to make character transformations are ignored, like homoplasy that includes parallel or reversal evolution. And finally, the cycles in median joining network, and I say cycles instead of reticulation because it lacks directionality. The cycles does not represent reticulate <laughs> evolution, but it only visualizes the conflicting signals in the data when there are multiple pathways to connect two haplotypes together within the same number of differences. For the second half of my thesis, I approached the question using empirical data set uh, and I evaluated the topological incongruence between the branching patterns 
produced from median joining network and Bayesian phylogenetic tree using the same data set. So basically I collected 85 published empirical data sets from the literature um, where the data set was used to construct the median joining network in the original study. The characteristics these 85 data sets are shown in the plot on the left side where the x-axis represent the case number from one to 85 and the y-axis represents the number of sequences that each data set contains ranging from around 10 to more than 200. About half of the data set was composed of mitochondrial DNA and another half nuclear DNA and about half of the data sets were from a single species and another half from multiple species. So for each of these data set, we constructed a median joining network and Bayesian inference phylogenetic tree. And we statistically compared the branching patterns from two methods using an approximately unbiased test or, or AU test, which is a kind of a likelihood ratio test. And we counted number of times where the significant differences in branching patterns were observed. And we found that the two topologies were incongruent in 32 out of 85 cases. And depending on how you look at this number, about one third of the cases might seem large or small, but thinking that there are more than 10,000 studies that employed median joining network, and many of them tries to identify the phylogenetic relationships haplotypes or sequences. Imagining that more than one third of them can be misleading for me is a frustratingly large number. So uh, despite these flaws, median journey network continues to be flourishing in practice. And I'd like to share one of the examples, which is a paper that was published in PNAS in 2020 with a very ambitious title saying the phylogenetic network analysis of COVID-19 genomes. So basically, uh, and this study actually has re received a lot of attention from the media, particularly for the big media companies like BBC. And in this study, they had a single figure, which is a median joining network shown here that was constructed from the COVID-19 genomes collected around the world available at that time. So in this study, the authors, sorry. Okay. In this study, the authors uh, uh, over-interpret, un unfortunately over-interpreted this network. Uh, they tried to identify the origin of the pandemic based on the network. And they also tried to trace transmission history of the virus. And it was frustrating because the pandemic just began and everybody got locked down in their house and we didn't really know much about the virus. And reading this, paper, uh, this kind of papers and imagining it can be misleading and last the pandemic longer was actually really frustrating. So myself, along with my colleagues and my advisors, we submitted a rebuttal letter to PNAS, also with a very strong title, saying the median joining network analysis is neither phylogenetic nor evolutionary. In this study, we tried to make two points. The first one is that median joining network does not inform ancestor descendant relationships. Therefore, we can identify the origin of the pandemic. And second point is that even though somehow median joining network tells us something phylogenetic relationships between virus, relying on a single phylogenetic tree to trace transmission, transmission history is not a good practice. So what should have they done? They should have estimated the explicit networks. Um, in recent years, a handful of methods that estimates explicit networks from the genomic data has been proposed, and they can largely classify it as summary-based methods, which take a set of gene trees as input, and full data methods that, take, uh, that directly take the sequence data as input. The summary-based methods are advantages because they are relatively fast, but their accuracy completely depends on the quality of the estimated gene trees. On the other hand, the full data methods can utilize the signal in the alignment, but they're computationally very heavy, limiting their use to a very small data set. So this leads to the main question of my doctoral dissertation. Can we estimate a phylogenetic network directly from the sequence data efficiently and accurately? And long answer short, yes, we can do that. And we do so by combining the composite likelihood framework, or sometimes referred to as the pseudo likelihood framework, uh, with the site pattern frequency data that can be extracted from the alignment. So what do I mean by site patterns? So site pattern is a, is a pattern of the nucleotide assignment at the tips of a topology. 
So for example, let's consider a network uh, topology on the left side and the corresponding sequence alignment on the right side. If we select the very first column of the sequence alignment and we map that on the topology, we will get a site pattern of AAAAA that tells us there's no variation between five species at that specific site. We can do the same thing for the fifth column, for example, and we will get a site pattern of TTAAT, which tells, a bit, which tells us a bit more story than in the previous case, because species three and four shares the same nucleotide that is different from everybody else. Now, one thing to remember is that each of these sites is called coalescent independent site. And even if it might look similar, they're different from SNP data because coalescent independent sites also consider the sites where there is no variation as we see in site one there. So uh, for the next few slides, I'm going to introduce and talk about how we compute the composite likelihood of a modern network shown here with five species and a single replication. But before I do that, I'd like to formally introduce a number of parameters that we are interested in estimating. The first one is tau that represents a set of species and times where each element in this set is assigned to each internal tree vertex measured in coalescent unit backward in time. The second parameter is gamma that denotes inheritance probability that is assigned to one of two reticulation edges towards the reticulation node. And because gamma is a probability, uh, it ranges from zero and one, which makes the inheritance probability for the other incoming edge the other incoming reticulation edge as one minus gamma. And biologically, gamma can be interpreted as the genomic contribution from one of the parents towards the hybrid daughter. And finally, we have data that denotes population size parameter, which is a single value that is assigned for the entire topology. So for the, uh, the first thing that we want to do is we want to break a network down into a set of parental trees or the display trees. And we do so by removing one of two incoming reticulation edges at a time. And each parental tree will have the probability that can be obtained by multiplying all of the inheritance parameters, inheritance probabilities that are assigned to the reticulation edge that are not deleted in the production of that particular parental tree. So here, uh, our network N is broken down into two parental trees where parental tree one has a probability of gamma and parental tree two with probability of one minus gamma. And for each of these parental tree, we further decompose it down to a set of quartets, which is simply a tree with four tips. And we do so by selecting four tips from the parental tree at a time along with the internal tree vertices that represent the most recent common ancestors for the pairs of taxa. So here by selecting species one, two, three, and four from our parent tree one, we get our first quartet. And we repeat this process for every possible combinations of four from the parent tree. And here we can extract five quartets from our parent tree one. And we can do the same thing for the other parent tree to get another five quartets from our parent tree two. Each of these quartets will also have the probability that is assigned to the parent tree that is decomposed from. Yeah, so zooming into one of the quartets, uh, since at a given site, each tip can have any one of four nucleotide states, there can be four to the four or 256 possible site patterns on a quartet. And these 256 site patterns can be best represented in the form of a uh, flattening matrix where each element in this matrix represents the true probability of observing specific site pattern. And if you look at this threatening matrix long enough, we can find some pattern. And most obvious and easy to find pattern in this matrix is the case where four species shares the same nucleotide state at a given site. There are four such cases, AAAA, TTTT, CCCC, and GGGG. And under the Jukes canon model, all of these four site patterns should have equal probability. And similarly, we can find another pattern, which is where species one, three, and four shares the same nucleotide that is different from species two. And there are 12 such cases in the matrix as shown here. And again, under the Jukes canon model, all of these 12 site patterns should have equal probability. 
And we continue to find this kind of pattern throughout the matrix. And we realized that there are 15 of these and letting I, J, K, and L denote distinct nucleotide states, A, C, T, or G. Uh, we can generalize the 256 site patterns into 15 site patterns shown here. And we're gonna call this set of 15 as PQ. And fortunately, the true site pattern probabilities for these 15 generalized site patterns can be computed for a quartet given a set of species and times and the population size parameter theta as shown in Chief Manuel Cabot for 2015. Now, given that we can compute the true site pattern probabilities of any quartet tree, we can also compute the site pattern probabilities of a quartet that is extracted from a network, which is simply the weighted sum of the quartets that has same four tips, um, same four tips and, uh, for a quartet that is decomposed over different parental trees. And when I say weight here is basically the probability that is assigned to a quartet or the parental tree that the quartet was decomposed from. And given that uh, in order to compute the, the likelihood of a quartet, we also need to get the observed site pattern frequencies. And we do so by creating a subset of data um, that contains four sequences, each of which also occurs in our quartet of interest. And for each site M in the subset of data, we create a little array called I that has length 15. And that tells us how many times each generalized site patterns were observed at that site. So basically it will be one for whatever site pattern observed at that specific site and zero for the rest. And we create this array of length 15 throughout the subset of alignment that, uh, with the length of big M. And in the end, we add all of these arrays together to get our array called W, which is also, which will also have a length 15 and it will tell us the observed site pattern frequencies for that subset of data. And with the site pattern probabilities, the true site pattern prob probabilities of a quartet PQ and the computed observed frequencies of site patterns WQ, we can get the likelihood of a quartet using this equation here, where J denotes one of the 15 site patterns and by multiplying all of the quartet likelihoods together, we can get the composite likelihood of a network. And this equation shown here is the objective function for our method. And by maximizing this function, by optimizing the set of parameters that contains tau, gamma, and theta, given the data, we can compute the maximum composite likelihood of a network topology. Now, uh, we, now there, uh, we have a way to evaluate the fit of a topology to the given data. Our next step is to find the topology that describes the data the best. And we do so by using heuristics. So let's imagine this, uh, this space of topology that has two peaks represent our network space. Uh, the higher peak is called global optimum and we're gonna call the lower peak called global optimum. So any point in this network space represents a topology. And the higher the altitude of the topology, higher the likelihood or the composite likelihood. So the idea is we start at a certain point in this network space. Somehow we traverse around the network space and our goal is to eventually reach to the global optimum that represents a topology with the highest likelihood. Um, of course, this is, a, this is a very simplified representation of what the network space actually looks like because every time we add a reticulation onto a topology, uh, I say reticulation equals to H, um, the dimensionality increases, which means there is a whole new space of topologies or whole new space of network topologies that needs to be searched. And what's more complicating is every time we move up the dimension, the likelihood of the topology at the global optimum of the dimension also increases. So unless we limit the number of dimensions to be searched, there will be two problems. One, the search will go forever. And two, even if it eventually converges to a single topology, that topology is going to have excessively large number of reticulations, which may not make any biological sense. Unfortunately, there is no straightforward way to identify this number of dimensions to be searched in prior to the analysis. So currently we are asking users to provide expected number of reticulations in the final network based on the data set, uh, based on the data set and based on their knowledge about the biological system that they're working on. 
So um, in order to traverse the network space, we have implemented five different loop strategies. And the first one is called nearest neighbor interchange, which has been very popularly used for the tree searching algorithms. Um, and because nearest neighbor interchange can only perform when the topology is a tree, we use this strategy to traverse the network space when the number of reticulation equals to zero, which is simply a tree space. And to jump up the dimension of the network space, we have another move called uh, addition of a reticulation. And to be a little more specific, let's say we have a topology shown here on the left side, which is a tree topology. First, we select, we randomly select two branches, and let's say we select the branches that leads to species three and species four. We create a node on that branch that will have in degree one and out degree one, and we simply connect these two nodes together and to create a reticulation, to create a reticulation, to introduce a reticulation onto a tree topology. The head and tail position will be randomly selected and the gamma parameter will be drawn from uniform distribution. And wherever the head is, it will be uh, the reticulation node with in degree two and out degree one. We have three different move strategies to traverse the network space within the same dimension when the number of reticulation is greater than zero, which is uh, we tweak the topology by changing the direction of a reticulation edge or change the head or tail position of a reticulation edge. Uh, first, to tweak a topology, tweak a network topology by changing the direction of a reticulation edge. We first select one of two reticulation branches towards a reticulation node based on their inheritance probability. So let's say we select this reticulation edge colored in red. Uh, secondly, we just flip the head and tail position of this reticulation edge. So what used to be the tail of the reticulation edge becomes the head, and what used to be the head becomes the, uh, becomes the tail. And uh, the new head will have in degree of two and out degree one, so that will be our new reticulation node. And what used to be the head of the selected reticulation edge will have in degree one and out degree two, so that will become a tree node. To tweak a topology by changing the head position of a reticulation edge, again, we select one of the reticulation edges based on their inheritance probability. And we also randomly select one of the tree branches and we create a node on that branch that will have in degree one and out degree one. And we simply change the head position of the selected reticulation edge to the newly created node. And now the newly created node will have in degree two and out degree one. So that will be our new reticulation node. And what used to be the head of the selected reticulation node will now have in degree one and out degree one. So by merging two branches before and after that node, we create a tree branch here. And finally, to tweak a network topology by changing the tail position, uh, again, we select a reticulation branch and we, we randomly select one of the tree branches and we create a node with in degree one and out degree one. We simply move the tail of the selected reticulation edge to the newly created node. And now newly created node will have in degree one and out degree two. So that will be the new tree node. And what used to be the tail of the selected reticulation branch will have in degree one and out degree one. So we will simply merge two branches before and after that node to create a tree branch. <clears throat> so now we have five different moves to traverse the network space. Our next task or the final task is to traverse the network space efficiently. And we have implemented two different strategies called hill climbing and simulated annealing. So hill climbing basically traverses the network space in a way that it only makes upward movement. And to be a little more specific, we start at a certain topology, NO, that can be either randomly generated or estimated from the data. We propose a new topology, N1, using one of the five moves. And if the likelihood of that new topology, L1, is greater than the likelihood of the starting topology, we accept that proposed topology and we move upward in the network space. In the case uh, when the new topology doesn't have higher likelihood and then the starting topology, we reject that proposal. And then we're gonna try another move from the starting topology uh, until we find the topology that will improve the likelihood. 
Unfortunately, because hill climbing only make upward movement, it has a risk of becoming stuck at the local optimum, which is another peak in the network space that is not the highest one. And to naively overcome or solve this problem, we have an option to conduct NNI movement on the starting topology in prior to the network search. So we can start in different points in the network space at different independent ones. But unfortunately, this approach does not fundamentally solve the problem of becoming stuck at the local optimum. So we also implemented our second strategy called simulated annealing, which traverses the network space in a way it makes upward movement, but also downward movement at some probability. So this probability of making downward movement or accepting topology that has worse likelihood can be computed using this equation here which basically depends on the, how much worse the new topology is in terms of, in terms of likelihood than the, than the previous topology that it was proposed from. So larger the difference, less the, like, uh, less the probability of accepting the worst topology. So larger the likelihood difference. And this probability of accepting the worst topology is also controlled by this CI, which is a control parameter that is updated at every iteration i, and is determined by a number of factors, including the sequence length, the number of sequences in the data set, as well as the maximum amount of likelihood change that can be, that can be made at a single step. And the details of simulating annealing can be found here at Delta and Paul 2001. Um, even though simulated annealing can more extensively traverse the network space than hill climbing, it has a downside, uh, which is it can take unnecessarily large number of steps to eventually converge to the global optimum, uh, which, can, which is directly translated as increased computational time. So all of the procedures that I have mentioned so far has been implemented in the Julia package called FINE. Uh, it's an acronym for phylogenetic network estimation. And we have tested the performance of FINE using uh, simulation and using empirical data sets. For simulation, uh, we basically compared the performance of FINE with two other methods that also uses composite likelihood framework implemented in Phylonet and SNAG uh, that, that uses a set of gene trees instead of sequence alignment as input. So to briefly go over the simulation pipeline, we generated sequence alignment based on the hybridization scenario shown here over various numbers of loci ranging from 50 to 5,000. And for each data set, we estimated a set of maximum likelihood gene trees using IQ tree, uh, which was subsequently used as an input file for Phylonet and SNAG. And we used the sequence alignment that was used to estimate the set of gene trees as input file for FINE and we used hill climbing and find using simulated annealing algorithm. I guess you can see my cursors too, right? Okay, good. So this plot here uh, summarizes the topological accuracy of the four methods that we compared, which is shown here on the x-axis colored differently over various numbers of loci, uh, which is shown on the y-axis on the right side. And we evaluated the accuracy of the estimated network using tripartition distance, which basically compares the estimated network with the true topology and it quantifies the difference. So when the tripartition distance equals to zero, that means two topologies are isomorphic or they are just identical. And as the tripartition distance gets further away from zero, the two topologies are more different from each other, which we interpreted as reduced accuracy. Each of these circles represents the, the tripartition based distance for the estimated topology. And there are many of these because we conducted 100 replicates. And the violin plot below these circles represents the, the proportion, the frequency of tripartition based distance uh, given that specific condition. So when the number of loci was 50, we see that fine, both using hill climbing and simulating annealing, we construct the true topology much more frequently than either Phylonet and SNAG. Probably this is implying that fine is better at extracting the signals in the data than uh, when the number of loci is small than when it's summarized into a set of gene trees. When the number of loci was 200, 500, or, or, or 1,000, all four methods uh, performed similarly, uh, reconstructing the true topology about half of the time and the frequency increased as we get more numbers of loci. 
And when the number of loci was 3,000, our four methods performed similarly well, uh, reconstructing the true topology pretty frequently and most frequently in SNAG. And when the number of uh, loci was 5,000, all four methods almost always reconstruct the true network topology. Uh, this plot here summarizes the running time of the four methods uh, colored differently uh, over various numbers of loci as shown here on the x-axis. And we measure the running time in hours, which is shown on the y-axis. The first thing to note is that regardless of numbers of loci, the running time for all four methods were consistent which basically shows the power of composite likelihood, uh, because if we, have, if we conducted the maximum likelihood, likelihood inference of network, uh, the running time will probably will increase exponentially as the number of loci increases. The second point is that we can see that uh, the running time for snack, phylonet, and fine using hill climbing are all clustered here near zero, meaning that they are computationally very efficient and all three methods completed analysis within 15 minutes. But when we were using FINE with simulated annealing algorithm, it took, uh, it took a little more time. It took about three hours in average uh, because simulated, when we conduct simulated annealing searching strategy, uh, it more extensively searches the network space. So it's not surprising that it takes more time. But three hours for a network analysis, honestly, is not too bad number for me. And at this point, you might wonder, okay, Kevin said he's going to develop a method that's going to be very efficient, but it seems like it's as efficient as the existing methods. Well, we need to consider the time to summarize the sequence alignment into a set of gene trees and estimating the gene trees is computationally heavy. And gene tree estimation can take a long time when the number of data, a number of loci is large, which in our case took more than 200 hours when there were 5,000 loci. Of course, this process can be facilitated by parallelization, but that's only possible when such computational resources are available. And finally, uh, we applied our methods to number of empirical data sets. And here I show an example of using Papionini primates, which is presented in Van der Poel at all 2020. So in this data set, they contain seven primate species, uh, three macaca species, uh, which is acute primate shown here on the left side, all of which occurs in Asia, and four other Papuanini species, uh, all of which occurs in Africa. So in this study, the authors detected six introgression scenarios, all of which are uh, using Delta, which is similar to Ababa or these statistics, um, but using gene trees. They identified four introgression events between an Asian and an African species, and they identified a single introgression event among the Asian species and another one among the African species. And using this data set composed of uh, seven species with an outgroup, we conducted two network analysis, assuming the number of reticulation equals to one and two. When the number of reticulation uh, was assumed to be one, uh, we, uh, we found a single reticulation event among the African species as shown here in the network on the left side. And when the number of reticulation was assumed to be as two, this uh, reticulation among the African species was uh, uh, retained, um, but also we found another reticulation event among the Asian species. But for both networks, we did not observe uh, reticulation between an Asian or and between Asian and African species, which kind of makes sense considering the geographic, uh, geographic distance between those species. So in summary, I'm very excited to announce that our method is implemented in the Julia package fine and it's about to get released. Uh, and I'm planning to release in short future um, along with our manuscript. Um, currently fine takes in five sequence alignment and it yields networks in an extended new format. The biggest advantage of our method is that it bypasses data summarization step or gene tree estimation step, which can be very time consuming and can be uh, cause a lot of unwanted gene tree estimation errors, and we utilize all phylogenetic signals in the alignment. I'm very happy that our study makes some move forward in the network inference problems, but there are still many gaps that needs to be filled. One of the first gaps uh, that needs to be filled is to identify the root position of a network using site pattern frequencies. I want to work on this in the future. 
And uh, this is because we are working on the rooted phylogenetic tree. Currently, we are asking users to provide an outgroup sequence so we can root the network. But when biologists are working with genomic data set, particularly with non-modern organisms, these good outgroup sequences might not always readily available. Fortunately, there is a way to identify a root position using site pattern frequencies in the case of trees. And I'm thinking we can maybe extend that idea to the network case. The second gap that needs to be filled is to identify the number of reticulations in a network in prior to the analysis. And identifying this number is important because we need the number of, we need to limit the number of dimensions of network space that needs to be searched. Unfortunately, this is not uh, straightforward. And honestly, I am not really sure how to approach this problem, but this is something that I'm defi definitely interested in working on in the future. And finally, because our method requires a network to be broken down into a set of gene, a set of parental trees, we are only assuming the true network lies in the space of level one networks. And this level one, that the class of level one network consists only a small portion in the in the in the entire network space. So in the future, I'd like to work on developing a method that can quantify the fit of a topology that is beyond level one for the data. So that being said, I'd like to thank and give biggest gratitude to my, my advisor, Dr. Laura Kabatko, and my co-author, Dr. David Swafford, as well as Dr. Jing Peng, Christina Wiki, and Claudia solis Lemus, who gave me a valuable advice in developing FINE, and also a number of funding organizations from Society of Systematic Biologists, Society for the Study of Evolution, and Ohio State University for presidential uh, fellowship and departmental grants. Thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Can I 